everyone, it's our great honor to have Shada Moore with us. She's the one maker at her family winery. Hello, ones. Hello, yeah. ones. She is a Vinifer Your Master classmate of mine, and she has a very solid background in studying and working in different parts of the world in the wine industry. For example, in France, Germany, Australia, and of course, her home country, India. And she's working with Asian and indigenous grape variety from India which are going to be the up and coming Indian signature grape or grape varieties, depending how many are there. Now we're going to delve deep into this grape variety together with Shada. Hi Shada, thank you so much for your time, for joining us. And please introduce yourself to us. Yes, thank you so much, Shawen. It's so great to see you and it's so great to be part of this interview. So I'm really honored that you invited me. And I'm actually very thankful that I can get to share my stories with you. Yes, so I really appreciate it. Thank you so much again. So this is uh, Shraddha Mode from India. So like I, like Shawan said, I'm her classmate. I uh, was her classmate in Winifera Euro Euromaster 2017 batch. And before that, I have done my foundation degree in United Kingdom. Uh, called the foundation degree in wine production and before that I was uh, studying as a bachelor's in, and I did, did it in biotech in, from Nasik so, uh, and from India and then recently I've been back to India after completing several vintages uh, doing in abroad like UK then uh, also uh, Germany, France and Australia. So I've been recently coming back to my family winery, which started in 2001. So I'm recently the head winemaker and head viticulturist there. So let's start with knowing more about the region, Nashik, one capital of India. Tell us more about Selo One and what's the total production? What are your main markets? Uh, so Silo Wines actually started by my parents uh, in 2001. And um, since then, they have started with 25,000 liters. And now we are up to the capacity of uh, 500, sorry, 5,000 hectoliter, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, because our conversions are different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 5,000 hectoliter is our uh, maximum capacity per year right now. And initially, we were working with uh, international varieties like Syrah and uh, Cabernet and Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc. But uh, over the years, due to climate and everything, uh, we have shifted our vineyards to the local grapes, like past uh, three years. However, we were uh, we also take of different uh, how do you say grapes from different farmers around the local region for our base wine and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we have uh, grown our uh, portfolio to our different ranges of wines, like we have uh, red dry. Then you have uh, red sweet and rosé, and yeah, we have a range of wines compared to white, rosé, and reds. And we also have dessert wines. Now we'll be entering sparkling too uh, from next year. Your market at the moment is it like focus on domestic markets? Uh, we have actually uh, been involved in markets around the borders of India. Mm -hmm. So we have a uh, Sikkim market, then you have Arunachal, that's the different states in uh, India, which is Northeast states. So we are more focused on the Northeast market as uh, for us, it's a very growing and demanding market compared to the region and that is Maharashtra. So we always focus, we are focusing on this market since 20 years and uh, we are the 80% market hold, uh, shareholder over there. So that is like the highest demand for our wines there in Northeast oh, wow. regions. Uh, yeah, no, also like in India, you have very high import tax. In China, I thought yes. it's already like super high, right? We have 49.5% of import oh. tax. Then the other day oh, wow. I heard like the import tax to India is like 150%. Yes, wow. yes. <laughs> it actually was 200 before, mm -hmm. but now it has come down to 150. Okay. I mean, there was a trade, um, uh, how do you say, the MOU was signed between Australia and India recently. Okay. And because of that, they have lowered the import duty, actually. 
it was 200 before now it has come to 150 but now uh, the government is actually working towards even lowering the uh, import duties in the future for that so that the international wines also can come into india mm -hmm. and you know because they can see the growth of indian consumers here and that's why that's why they're working on lowering it and uh, yeah i hope it happens so we will we will get to taste lots of different wines from all over the world yeah, 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 the Indian market is so dynamic. And even though, yeah. let's say, the tax is so high, but there are a lot of brands are coming to India because they know <laughs> like the huge population there and the people yes. are so enthusiastic about wine as a product. Yes, because they're so excited. I mean, the wine culture in India is really growing. So you can see the excitement and enthusiasm and also curiosity towards trying different wines of the world. I mean, you know, uh, people were actually very uh, narrow-minded in the same in the saying that okay, wine. They they were like they were uh, demeaning wine in a certain sense because they're actually focusing on more whiskey and beer market. Like we have, that's the highest percentage in India. If you look at the statistics and everything, so yeah, considering uh, the change and the shift in their behavior, it's really promising that okay, India will also be a good wine market in the future. So please share with us a bit more regarding like the viticultural aspects of it. Like what's the climate, soil, the rainfall and things like that. So as you know, it's like the wine capital of uh, India called Nasik. But you have to understand that Nasik is in region. It's in a very different, uh, how to say, it's very versatile and diverse when it comes to its climate, its soil, its annual rainfall and altitude and everything. So for instance, the altitude actually changes from uh, different regions in Nasik. So we have a different parts of uh, region in Nasik where grapes grow. So for instance, uh, from where I come from is Pimpalgao Baswant, which is like 30 kilometers from Nasik and Dindori, which is like 20 kilo kilometers from Nasik. Also Gangapur, where your famous Sula wines is there. Mm -hmm. So that is comes out to be an altitude of 614 uh, meter. Yeah, and then it's 600 it's on the 14 or six, yeah, 614, 614 614 from sea level. Uh, we have the altitude of 584 meters where I come from. And in total area, if you look at for Nasik, it's 700 meters. Okay, so yeah, About there is uh, a little bit altitude. Yes, it's altitude diverse. Yes, yes, yes. So around uh, for the uh, climate, where you can say the climate, the annual rainfall for the whole region of uh, Nasik is about 500 to 28 to 614 uh, mm of rainfall. That is actually uh, the annual rainfall that happens. But due to climate change, there has been a very uh, unpredicted amount of rainfall that has really damaged the crop of the farmers here. So recently we had a rainfall of around uh, 26 mm and 30 mm rainfall during our flowering stage, which really hampered the entire grape crop of uh, Nasik actually this year. So it has been very unpredictable. The climate is not usually the same how it was before. I mean, it has been really changing since the climate change. It's getting a little bit hotter. It's it's raining at very unusual timings. Also, it, in every phase of our viticulture, we are worried that okay, now it's going to be a rainy season. Now it's going to be it's going to be a rainfall. Also, hailstorm is a huge issue in this area because there are so many water bodies. Like we have uh, lots of dams are there, lots of rivers are there around it. So we have a very pressure belt that has been built in this area. So it's forming lots of, uh, how do you say, there's lots of dew in the morning, right? And also unpredictable hailstorm and unpredictable rainfall is also there. So we have to be really on our toes, actually, when we uh, mitigate all the viticulture aspect of it, we really have to be very careful. And especially the type of varieties we are working with. And suppose if it's a Pinot Noir or a Riesling or Shiraz or Cabernet, we have to be really careful because it, they are very sensitive to these climatic changes that happens in the vineyard. So therefore my quest, like how she said, like it's for indigenous varieties, that's why I'm going for it because the climate needs it, you know, and it's the need of the R that we actually focus on our roots that was, you know, before like 100 or 200 years back. 
where mm. people were using these varieties and they were not worried about the climate change because it was a very sturdy varieties mm -hmm. that they used to use it i mean that's the climate scenario of nasik where whereas when you consider the soil also soil is also different in various regions so for instance where i come from bimpilgao the soil is around 40 percent clay then you have loamy soil then you have a little bit of stilt as well mm -hmm. then there's uh, calcium uh, deposits also when you go below around uh, six meter below uh, the soil levels because we have analyzed and checked what type of soil we have before we planted the vineyards last year and we have we found out there was lots of calcium deposits below six meter of our soil levels also there's a salty uh, clay also is there so it's white in color mm -hmm. and due to such variations in different regions uh, farmers are more focused on the type of rootstock they should use because of the different soils that they have mm -hmm. also the type of varieties that they should use in combination with the rootstocks as per the varieties and as per the soil aspect of it so there's variations of soil but i would say that the maximum what you can find in uh, nasik region is black soil mm -hmm. which can consist of clay that is 40 percent and then 60 percent is like sandy loamy soil which has an highest organic matter and organic carbon in it okay so, so yeah yes. So speaking of the rootstocks, uh, which kind of rootstock is used most often in your region? Uh, for for here, for this region, we have our own produced Dobris rootstock, which was produced in Bangalore, which came from the U.S., like we all know, Dobris has come from the U.S. But however, American Dobris were giving lots of trouble with us in terms of irrigation and everything but so we created our own rootstock called the bangalore dogris which has been developed by the bangalore research institute in india which is our kind of like south uh, india mm -hmm. so they have introduced this uh, dogris rootstock however in recent times we have been changing the course of the use of the rootstock from we are going from dogris to pulsin and from Pulsen to 140RU, then you have 110R, then you have, uh, what do you say? Yeah, and then you have a, a Gravisac also. We have been using Gravisac as well. So, so we have been uh, experimenting with different rootstocks. So for instance, in my vineyards, I first saw the soil structure, the soil ratios, what they have, what is the, uh, how do you say, uh, water capacity of the soil and everything. After that, I've decided, okay, fine, I have to use Pulsen because I want to use uh, less water in my vineyard, whereas Dogris get, uh, uses lots of water. For instance, one liter of water is used for Dogris, whereas 100 ml is used for Pulsen. I mean, that's the drastic difference between these two rootstocks. So my really focus was on get the right rootstock and then decide on the varieties. Mm -hmm. So for for my vineyard, I've been using Pulsen and Dogris. That has been true. But in the future, I'll be also considering 110R because it's really good in for black soils and very dense soils, what we have here. So also for 140RU because you use lots of, uh, if you don't want to use lots of water to get all the fruitiness in your berries, so I would consider using a 140RU as well in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the climate, would you generalize the climate as kind of tropical climates? Uh, yeah, considering we are really close to the equator. Mm -hmm. So what we have observed is like we have a tropical savanna, which mm -hmm. is wet. So for instance, we have mostly uh, hot and wet summers, right? And a warm and dry winter. But since I like I told you, like the climate change, we are really into a predicament that, okay, it's all, it's not, it was not the same as before. It has been changing. So during October, that is our uh, you know ongoing winter so we are entering winter in october but we have a rainfall and that's where our pruning is there so we have two pruning systems so in october there's a pruning system where uh, we kind of collided with the rainfall that is very unfortunate for us but uh, we have been very used to having a unpredicted rainfall in during september october that's beginning of winter and then we have another uh, rainfall season uh, starting from June, July. 
So June, July, August, uh, August, September. So there's this four month stretch of a proper rainy season. So we have four seasons in India. However, those seasons are like intermediated at the moment because it's all uh, due to climate change. Mm -hmm. And over the past years, it has been changing so much that uh, it's very hard to predict. Okay, fine, it's summer, so it's summer, but it can rain also. So it's it's very hard to say, okay, this is that type of uh, climate. So mm -hmm. the climate is not set on the tropical wet savanna. Mm -hmm. It is changing, but it's not going to the drier side, of course, but it's going to the wetter side, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I know that like, in some parts of Southeast Asia, like Thailand, they can harvest yeah. like three crops per year. Uh, so well, is yes. this the same situation where you are? Um, actually, I would say uh, I have tried it, uh, getting two crops a year for one of my varieties but i noticed some changes like i said in august we have the rainy season right mm -hmm. so imagine that you are harvesting your first crop in feb end of feb and you're again pushing the uh, wines into a second crop in august in august september mm -hmm. so there's not going to be much of nutrient that is left in the wines considering it's using its reserves for that so I would say that I, because when I tried it, it didn't give me a good result for the second crop. So I decided, okay, I'll just focus on the first crop itself. But however, like I said, in Do uh, Bangalore, there's a, a very uh, low pressure belt there that gets formed during August. So because the rain comes from Goa, right? Mm -hmm. The cloud comes from Goa and it just emerges up to Maharashtra. This is upper strait of India. So mm -hmm. there's a low pressure formation during uh, that climate phase for Bangalore, which does not give lots of high rainfall for Bangalore. So it can go for the second crop. So in Bangalore, if you go and visit, you'll see uh, grape harvesting plus pruning and everything at the same time. It really kind of mind boggles when you see that because the climate allows them to do that, right? So when I visited Bangalore, there was a vineyard that was getting harvested in September. Also, there was a vineyard who was in a pruning state for the next year. So it was so amazing to see such uh, diverse, uh, uh, how do you say, it? diverse training systems in the same uh, month and also the phases of different viticulture. You know, vineyard phases were so different. So it was really nice to see that and very astonishing also that weather, weather has so much control, like, you know, uh, influence on the BT culture cycle, like how mm -hmm. you in a vineyard cycle, it really influences a lot. And that's yeah. how you get to Bangalore. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, considering, yeah, like normally uh, there is just one crop per year, but like in certain uh, places in the world because of climate they can actually push it to have more crops uh, but yeah. yeah like your experiments also saying that we shouldn't push the ones kind of too much uh, because yeah. otherwise um, if we want the one to produce too much maybe the age potential yes. of the vineyard is lower that's true that's certainly true yeah Okay, so let's go into your winery, Silo One. So I know you made a one with a new hybrid grape. So it's developed yeah. by an Indian research institute. Uh, and you actually already started making wines with this grape party. So share with us more about this grape. Yes, yeah, so actually, I'll just tell you a brief background because I think that's very important. So like I said, I, I came back to India in 2018. Mm -hmm. So when I came back here, I was in a dilemma that, okay, how should I work? Because it's so different from where, what we have studied in school and what we have seen in Montpellier and Geisenheim and everything. And uh, I worked in different vineyards in the UK, in Germany and everything. So coming from the cool climate viticulture, you're entering into a hot climate viticulture or rather say warm low climate. Mm -hmm. So I was in a very fix, like, okay, how should I work? Because the training systems are different, the trellis systems are different, your uh, packet of pa practices are different for viticulture and everything. So when I saw it and when I was discussing with different farmers, I traveled around Maharashtra, my entire state, mm -hmm. to just see and observe what the farmers were doing, right? How they were, you know, uh, uh, how do you say, mitigating their challenges and everything. So 
I was really uh, curious to know how they do it. So while I was doing it, I came across certain things that were, farmers were really talking about. So they were talking about their ancient varieties. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what are these ancient varieties? I have never heard about it. So they were like, okay, we had a set of uh, grape varieties which didn't need much intervention, didn't need much, uh, how do you say, pest control or disease control because they were already resistant to its home country and mm -hmm. to its home region. So I was like, why can't you use such varieties now? So they're like, no, because it has been removed through the influx of international varieties. So people are more focusing on the table grape varieties that is uh, that has got from the uh, European markets or the Chilean market or the Argentinian markets. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of international wine varieties that was coming into India, like Pinot Noir, Riesling, Cabernet, Shiraz, or Viognier, or everything, Sanzuizi. So all those varieties were coming into India and they were pushing these old varieties, these ancient varieties, back into its history so when i heard about it i said okay fine it sounds really interesting so what can i do to get it back from you know these farmers or from history i want to re how do you say rejuvenate itself into these roots mm -hmm. so i was like okay fine i have to find these varieties so it took me three years to find these varieties from different farmers also i was working with different research institutes in india I was a technical wine advisor to National Grape Research Center, which is in Pune. So luckily I got to work with these varieties there. So I made wines from them, like around 56 different varieties I made wines from wow. there. So it was so amazing to see such varieties. I was like, why people have forgotten it? I mean, you should really talk about this because this could really help the farmers of India. I mean, instead of using so much of uh, disease control managements and everything, you can just focus on these varieties and go back to your roots. I mean, that was the reason that I was working with the uh, research institute called Agarkar, and they have developed their very own variety called the ARI 516, which is a combination of Katavba, which is from the US, like we all know, and Beauty Seedless, which is the Indian varieties. So it is actually uh, Lambrusca and Vitis vinifera's combination. So it's a hybrid. Mm -hmm. But those that hybrid is highly resistant to downy mildew, powdery mildew. Also, it does not get affected by the flood or dry region or dry climate or dry weather. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will give you an example of it. So one time we had an unusual uh, hailstorm and flood the last last year. Mm -hmm. And in that, my crop wasn't flowering like imagine in a flowering stage is a hailstorm and you can't believe when I went to the vineyard in my gum boots and everything and I saw there's absolutely no damage at all so those flowers were smiling they're like okay nothing happened to us you know and then I was so surprised and all the farmers around our neighbors and everything we were so surprised how come this variety sustained such harsh climate so this is the power of indigenous varieties Mm -hmm. because it understands its you know uh, roots it understands its climate and it it's it changes according to it you know it adapts itself to it so i think at that time i got, got to know the power of indigenous and ancient varieties of india then i started on a quest i was like okay i have to find all these varieties and i have to get it back into my vineyard it took me three years to find around 10 different uh, indigenous grape varieties of india Mm -hmm. and around 12 different varieties that have been uh, researched under the Indian Institute of India, which is for different viticulture and everything. So now total we have 22 different varieties in our vineyard right now, which we have planted last year in seven acre of land. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, that's an exciting yeah. project. Absolutely. So how yes. do you get, let's say, the the cuttings for these Asian grape varieties? You have to go to the old vineyard and collect those cuttings? Yes, actually, uh, so I was working with three, four farmers in mm -hmm. my region, and luckily they happened to have these varieties. So they were preserving it from so long. I mean, their forefathers had bought these varieties 
from their uh, historical predestinants and everything. So they were preserving these varieties. I don't know for who or for what, but when they came across, like okay, I was collecting, they were so grateful and they were so you know cooperative and everything that okay, you want these varieties, please take it all. You won't believe that they they gave me uh, the first year crop that they had all the gra grapes just for my wine making and also the cuttings the next year they gave me for for my vineyard plantation and everything so i got like around five different varieties from one farmer then i got three four varieties from another farmer and then two three varieties from the next so it always all became from one connection to another it led me to them i mean one farmer used to give me an information on the next and then i used to visit the vineyard i used to, I used to see the crop I, I did every research what i could do because not much data was available on these varieties to be honest so i really had to dive in myself to do the research like what is this anthocyanin levels what are the phenolic levels how is the color how well the wine can be made from it so all these little little aspect was so important into the quality uh, formation of those wines that it took me around three years, three to four years to just get those varieties right. And I made wines since three years. I've been making wines from these varieties before I planted it. So once I was really sure, okay, fine, I can make such wines from it. Then I planted those varieties last year. And this will be my first vintage of it this year, 2024. Wow, yeah. That's such yeah. a meaningful project. I'm sure those farmers, they're really excited to see the yeah. young generation of winemaker is preserving this like asset actually of the <laughs> wine industry in India. Yes, yes. So actually indirectly, they have just uh, preserved or, you know, uh, saved some bottles from me. Mm -hmm. So it is my obligation, like, you know, I share some bottles with them as, you know, part of their project as well, because it's, they have so much contribution towards this project that, you know, it's, Really, uh, really, thank you is not enough for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so basically, when you collect those cuttings, you have to go back to the laboratory and kind of analyze what's the ge genetic origin of these grape varieties, right? Because over the years, there are mutations and things have changed. And so, how how do you manage that? Um, actually, when I did those, uh, took those cuttings and everything, uh, there was already a data available on the Vitas catalog, mm -hmm. which was which I referred to. So, because these varieties were old, however, they had not got got any mutation changes over the years, mm -hmm. because those varieties were in the, in, in the family of the farmers since four or five generations. Mm -hmm. So they they had the data of that. If whether there was changing effects or anything but so far when i discussed with them they're like you know there's no no changes that has been that we have observed till now mm -hmm. and even our forefathers were did not uh, you know how to say they did not observe any changes in those varieties but however uh now that you have mentioned about the vt culture uh genetic mutations and everything we have a data in the research uh national research center for grapes in pune mm -hmm. yeah so so far they have been using such cuttings for making the new varieties so they had been using one of the uh, varieties called anabi shahi which was actually gotten from uh, persia to india many many decades like many years ago i think it was around 500 years ago mm -hmm. those cuttings were in back to india in hyderabad for the first time so they are using such varieties to develop new varieties in india i mean they have been using such cuttings for that our breeders in uh, the research institute have been using such because why because they are resistant to different uh, grape diseases and they have more they're more adaptable to the climate and everything mm -hmm. yeah yeah that makes sense so those grapes yeah. let's say in the past maybe 10 100 years ago are they yeah. using for table grapes are those are using to make one as well like back in the past I think back in the past, the wine uh, era had not started for India. Mm -hmm. So it started around uh, 1950, around 1957, mm -hmm. after the uh, independence. And before that, they were always using such varieties for table grape, for juice making, for raisins and everything. But, you know, uh, because it has seed in it, 
it's not a seedless uh, varieties mm -hmm. so when i saw it when i tasted it and i was like okay you can make such good great good wines from it i mean you know because it has flavor right it has the right amount of acidity it has the right amount of phenolics in it also it has its own characteristics i mean you can really recognize such varieties when you taste it so when i came across these grapes i was like okay why not make wine of it if it is it's very amazing to taste it's amazing as a table grape it can make itself into raisins very well why not wine so that was my first thinking okay fine i'll make wine from this indigenous or ancient grape varieties before because nobody in india has ever done it i'll be the first one to do it for india wow yeah that's super exciting absolutely uh so in the vineyard how you manage these grape varieties like there is a special type of training or trellising system you're using yes actually in india we have certain uh trellis system like we have the gdc mm -hmm. then you have the pergola system then you have the y system and the v system mm -hmm. uh, also our vineyard is not like most of the uh, local grapes that we have they use the gdc system mm -hmm. but if you have the wine variety like syrah and, and cabernet and shannon they use the vsp but the vsp the aspect is really different and if you have a higher altitude where you don't have the problems of you know uh, local animals coming in or the wildlife or wild animals coming in then you can go for vsp in my region you'll see lots of wild animals like you know uh, they have uh, cheetah is also there then you have uh, uh, how do you say wolf is also there so oh, for wow. me i can't afford to go for vsp because mm -hmm. if the vsp and during fruiting season all my grapes will be gone if i'm on vsp Mm -hmm. so i always have a higher uh, length when it comes to the trellis system so i use the gdc and the pergola for right okay. now because i was planning into vsp but then i observed all these local problems are like okay i can't go for vsp can't afford to go for vsp in this region maybe if i was at a higher elevation then mm -hmm. i would have gone for vsp but normally most of the farmers are using gdc uh, and the Y system and uh, some of the wine growers, they're using VSP mm -hmm. as per their requirements and everything. Yeah. Okay. So the reason you choose it is mainly because of this, uh, let's say, pest. <laughs> There's a uh, big yes. animals eating the grapes. Also, uh, because uh, when you have a GDC, because mm -hmm. I have lots of, lot many hours of sunlight. So I want to use a maximum of it, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, even if I uh, go for VSP, I will have the issues of sun burning, mm -hmm. especially yeah. during ripening season. So I don't want that. So I want my grapes to be a little bit uh, taken care of under the uh, leaves. So I do the canopy management as also, but I do the canopy management in considering the amount of sunlight that I have this week you know and mm -hmm. if i have to do a leaf removal or a shoot thinning and everything so i have to really consider the amount of sunlight especially during ripening season i mean we don't have an issue during uh, bud burst from bud burst till flowering i mean it is okay but as soon as it hits raison raison after that i have to really be careful because it mm -hmm. can go to sun burning stage also which i don't want so I have to keep amount of some amount of leaves on the uh, grape berry, but mm -hmm. I also do the leaf removal for extra like you know color extraction and lots of secondary metabolites I want to like uh, incur into the berries also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for your vineyard management, so it's all done by by human being, or you also use a tractor to do certain type of vineyard management. So when it comes to the soil uh, application and everything, we have a drip system, automatic drip system here. Mm -hmm. uh, like we are allowed to do a dripping and you know irrigation in our region, of course, considering the climate and everything. Mm -hmm. So we have the irrigation system. We always use uh, water-based uh, fertilizers whenever mm -hmm. we can, especially if we have to work on the soil. And you, when you have to work on the soil tilling and everything, we have a tractor for it. But however, uh, for the leaf removal, for the shoot thinning, we always prefer for the uh, labor work. Like we have uh, many teams of us. We have a tender teams that come come with us and for only for seasons and everything. We have a set of number of workers that are working for us annually. 
and also by season. So uh, consider that annually uh, for season, it is around 60 to 70 workers in our uh, winery and vineyards all to put together. And for annually during off season, we have around 20 different workers working in the vineyard as well as in the winery. Yeah, mm -hmm. so mostly I would say it's human based uh, practices that ha happens in India because labor is very cheap here. Mm -hmm. So also it's readily available, right? You can exactly. easily get, and I think yeah. It's very important for employment of these, uh, you know, uh, workers also because if mm -hmm. we use lots of machines here, I mean, their uh, how will their house work? I mean, that is their that as a social obligation for mm -hmm. us, it's very important that we, you know, don't lose the human touch when it comes to our vineyard practices and everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Human being can be gentle and can be selective, and those can exactly. only be achieved. I think you can labor. get a lot of high quality grapes if mm -hmm. you have a human intervention. And mm -hmm. because I, I'm actually, I don't know, I have a very strong opinion when it comes to machine harvesting, mm -hmm. because for machine harvesting you lose a lot of quality. That's what I believe, and I have seen that. So I always prefer hand harvesting. Mm -hmm. and you know uh, hand uh, leaf uh, removal then shoot thinning because i can tell them what i really want you know i can tell them okay plug this leaf plug that leaf i don't have to really uh, rely on the machine to do that so for us it's very important the human intervention yeah yeah absolutely so besides let's say these animals as the pest for the vineyard is there any other diseases like you are combating with Yes, so we have a beetle uh, issues also. We have a grape borer, mm -hmm. so a tiny insect, which gets into the wood, the trunk, mm -hmm. right, from the bottom, and it yeah. uh, drills its way up into the entire trunk, and it comes from the shoot out. So imagine oh. the whole vascular bundle is disrupted. I mean, this is the biggest uh, pest that is it's like a biggest threat to the vine because mm -hmm. it's just disrupting its vascular bundle right because once yeah. your vascular bundle is disrupted i mean no matter how much fertilizers you add no matter how much you take care of those vines those uh, blocks are not going to be fulfilled right because it's all disrupted i mean this is the biggest pest that we have it's called a grape borer and we have different species amongst various vineyards and so many farmers are really affected by it I mean, I wish there was a way that, you know, this did, did, did not happen, but then this is a real issues here right now. So apart from like uh, powder mildew or downy mildew, that's like a basic that we have. I think we have seen it in every regions of the world, downy mildew and powder mildew. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, then there's the uh, grape beetle uh, fly. Then you have recently, we've been having issues with fruit flies. I mean, that's also one of the problems. Also this grape border. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, these are the four or five uh, great pests that we are facing issues with. Okay, so those hybrid you're working with, so they all have certain sorts of resistant maybe towards yes. one or two of these uh, yes. problems, yes. right? Yeah. Mm -mm. yeah, yeah. So they are resistant to downy mildew, powdery mildew. Also, I've been uh, observing uh, it's resistant towards uh, grape borer also, luckily. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the rest of the vineyard was affected. The local grape vineyard was affected, but the wines where, where we had planted, those wines were not affected by grape border. I mean, we have to really look into the studies, like why it, it did not affect them. Obviously, is there any genetic uh, relation to it? Or is there any uh, pheromones that has been released by the plant or anything? So we have to really look into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so regarding the density of planting, what's the like average density you have in your in your vineyard? So the average density, I would say it is by nine by six. So it was like for one row, we have 128 uh, wines per row. I mean, that's the density that we have currently. Uh, many of the farmers, they are using low density depending on the soil and everything if their soil permits them to do it or if the yield that they're looking for is really low then they increase the wine density yeah but now since uh we are looking at the, the how do you say the yield around uh around eight to ten kilos of fruit mm -hmm. per wine 
for one. I mean, that's that mm -hmm. we are looking for. And as we have to increase the quality, we will go even lesser than that. So lesser is like five to six kilograms per wine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so it's more important is the, let's say the yield per one rather than thinking about like what's the density or what's the number of plants per hectare because that will based on the soil conditions or like yes. other factors. Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, irrigation. So yeah, you mentioned like you can irrigate in your vineyards and how often and how, how, how do you manage it? Um, to be honest, it all depends on the region where you are at. Mm -hmm. So in the region where I'm from, uh, we require uh, irrigation from time to time in different phases of the vineyard mm -hmm. and depending on the grape variety because some of the grape variety does not need the exact amount of water that the other variety needs. So we have a, a different cock system. So we have a different uh, line of irrigation for each varieties. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the need of it. It's not like the uh, the entire seven acre is of the one uh, irrigation system. It has different layers of irrigation system depending on the rootstock. Like I said before, we have pulsin in our uh, three acres of vineyard and mm -hmm. the rest is Tauris. So for the three acre of vineyard, the water management is really different compared to the Tauris system. Mm -hmm. So the water management in the in the three acre, it has around uh, 15 different vineyard uh, varieties. So different varieties will also incur different water management system. So we look into that for each row, there's a different pipelines, which will give different water. Suppose if uh, one variety does not need it, so we shut off the cock from there and the other variety gets it. So we really have to, you know, look at each varietal level water management rather than, you know, vineyard water management. Okay, so it's very precise in terms of very the water precise. Management. Regarding the age of the wines, uh, so what's the average age of the wine, maybe in the region and also in your winery? Uh, the region, I would say around 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Some of the farmers are uh, just replanting it after 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number has been now reduced. It's to five years. So after every five years, the farmers are doing replantation. Oh wow! I mean, it's a lot yes. Of work. So yeah. yes. So earlier, this number was high because uh, when my grandfather used to do farming and everything, the number was about forty years, thirty years wine age. However, this has been decreased because so many uh, soil uh, diseases and so many what do you say pest management issues, and may also the farmers are very eager to plant new varieties. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a basic reason why this happens. So every five years, uh, they want to plant a different varieties and, you know, uh, run its experiment on it and everything for the market, especially for table grapes. For table grapes, people are now focusing on changing their varieties every five years and every 10 mm. years. Yeah, that's I mean, a totally for, different market, let's yeah. say, compared yes. to the wine grape. Okay. Yeah, so for yeah. wine grapes, people are more focused on getting those wines uh, into the older side because they understand that it can bring a different quality change mm -hmm. compared to the new wines and the old wines that we have always seen in France and in Burgundy and Bordeaux regions that older wines always gives you an extra edge compared to the new uh, wines. Mm -hmm. So now people have started to realize that. And in my vineyard, I try to at least will keep this varieties for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to see the difference, you know, how it was, how it has been evolving I mean, I really uh, like the aspect of wine age as the parameters for uh, you know, wine quality because we have seen that mm -hmm. with different winemakers around the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, your grandfather actually started the first uh, winery, first cooperative winery in India. So let's delve into that. That's quite an interesting project and very meaningful as well. So he started making sparkling wine in in Nashik, uh, with a yes. great variety, which is the Thomasson Citlus. Do you know some wine making back then? Like what kind of sparkling wines they are making, and what kind of challenges they are having? Uh, so my grandfather started this project called the Pimp and Co-op in uh, 1986, 85, 86. So what he did was 
and the reason why he did that because when he was lo looking into farmers uh, problems that okay you know you're not getting the market rate that you want for table grapes mm -hmm. right so in order to provide them an extra income source through their own hard work so my grandfather was like why can't we make wine of it if you're not able to sell it at least make wine of it so it won't go to waste and you know it will be a second income for every farmer every local small farmers mm -hmm. around maharashtra around india so the project brought around 4000 farmers that were you know helping him to uh, build this pimpin co-op so in collaboration with shabu and phils it's a champagne house in champagne mm -hmm. And uh, with his, their uh, collaboration, so my grandfather went to Italy, my grandfather went to Champagne just to find a collaborator, you know, for making wines in India, especially sparkling wines in India. So a, a Champagne house called Shabu and Phils really were excited, like, okay, we can really go for this project. So they collaborated with my grandfather and they sent their 21 years old winemaker called Jackie Nook. Mm -hmm. So Jackino came to India in 1986 to make wines in India. He used to stay at our, at our house and he used to, you know, go to the uh, winery bicycle. Mm -hmm. He used to ride the bicycle and then, you know, he used to just go there and work by himself. He worked with us for around four, two, three, four years. And he was using local grape varieties called Thompson Seedless mm -hmm. because even he was very intrigued that, okay, how, how about we use, you know, Indian grape varieties rather than Pinot Noir or Pinot Meunier. So we can just use such varieties. So he made the first vintage of Thompson Seedless in 1986. And he aged those wines for around 12 months, 12 to 14 months. Mm -hmm. And when he gave those wines for tasting, for like, you know, wine judging in Paris, mm -hmm. you won't believe that uh, amongst the top 10 wines in the world, sparkling wines in the world, mm -hmm. it stood fourth in position. Oh, wow. So it came fourth. Yeah. So the, then it opened a whole new chapter for India mm -hmm. because my grandfather has started this co-op, uh, uh, how do you say, the company in mm -hmm. India and it won its first vintage uh, wine medal. It's as fourth in number in the world, top 10 world of uh, sparkling wines. And uh, using this local grapes called Thompson Seedless instead of Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. So it really shocked people that how it can, you know, get to that bit. That's the beauty of the Indian soil and the Indian climate and everything that really brought this whole project. And, you know, it just, it went successful but however uh, such project because it just gathered lots of political attention and everything and due to that it was shut down in 1989 i think and then it has been uh, recently uh, sold but then after it was sold or even before that my father just stepping on his uh, father's shoes so he started his own very own winery in 2001 getting inspired by his father and you know the amount of hard work he has he had put into that project so in order to not to let the legacy go he just started his own winery and then continued his legacy of his father and now I'm the third generation that has been taking this winery forward yeah, yeah. that's such an inspiring story so you also inspired by them every day I'm sure like to move forward yes. with the project Yes, okay, so yes. basically that one sparkling one made by your grandfather is using the traditional method, the same as yes, traditional method. Yeah. yeah, the only difference yeah. is the grape RT and yes. the local terroir. Okay. Yes. Uh yeah, so I have Mattia here as well. If you have a question, uh you can pop a question now, Matthias. Are you there? Hi guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I was wondering if uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shraddha, for for this uh, uh, for being here and talking uh, uh, about uh, what is going on in India. I uh, obviously I have a very poor knowledge on this uh, on what's <laughs> going on in this country, so it's very uh, very interesting. Uh, I had a question regarding the grape varieties that you use. You said you have some indigenous grape varieties from uh, uh, India. Uh, can, can can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Yes, of course. And uh, it's so nice to uh, finally see you and, you know, uh, be interacting with you. And uh, so the local varieties that we have for the indigenous varieties, there are four or five varieties that I've been working with. So the first is uh, Anabishahi. Then there's Fakri that has been got from, gotten from the Persia. So we call it in ancient varieties as it is not indigenous to itself. It has just gotten from another country to here around 500 years back. So it is considered as an ancient varieties. Whereas for indigenous one, the, the variety that I've been working with is ARI 516, which has been developed recently by a research institute, Agarkar. So that has been one of the varieties. However, there were other varieties called Bhokri. There's a Bhokri that is a white grape varieties. Then there's a black Kai Saibi that is black Saibi, which, which you will find the information on the Vitis catalog as well also, officially known as the Indian grape varieties. Those are black and uh, we also have a gulabi, which is actually Muscadi Hamburg, which was initially originated from Chile. However, it's very unknown for us to know how it got into India. However, it is the prominent grape varieties of the South India. So, which is also named as gulabi, which is actually an Indian grape variety acknowledged by the Vitis catalog. I mean, these are the four or five indigenous grape varieties that have been working with also the ancient varieties. Yeah, super interesting. In the future, for sure, you will also pick a nice name for them, right? Like for, for example, ARI 516, like in the future will become a nice name has an Indian yeah. character as well. Yeah, I hope so. I hope the name changes as it's very uh, kind of confusing when it's just a number. And, but it is actually uh, based on the uh, Agarkar Institute. So they have the initials in it. Mm -hmm. Also, the five and six is might be the number of hybrids that they have been working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now on our label that we have put, it's Katova and Beauty Seedless that we have been using on our labels for now. Mm -hmm. And recently, it it just bagged uh, uh, points of 89 out of 100 from a Norway wine critic. So for us, it was a really, really huge uh, accomplishment to, you know, really go with this indigenous wine varieties. Yeah, yeah, I read the article. Um, it has a lot of interesting aromas, which can only yes. be found in these grape varieties. Um, yes. Okay, so moving forward, I say to sum up this session, thank you so much for your very detailed explanation on Indian wines and these interesting grape varieties you're working with. Just for the future, what's your future plans? So I mean, the future plan really revolves around uh, introducing these varieties on a global forum. I mean, recognizing these varieties as India's principal varieties, like we have for other nations like for France and Germany and, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, they all have a set of principal varieties that normally they are working on, right? So my aim is to at, at least get these varieties into internationally recognized varieties for India. I mean, that is my future plans as it will really help the Indian farmers to not go here and there looking for different varieties to plant and where your varieties are already in your own nation, already in your own backyard. So I think I really want to focus on uh, just uh, getting these varieties back into the world, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so just yeah. Uh, uncovering these pearls around the world, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super exciting. We are looking forward to, to hear more on that, on the Indian signature grape varieties. And we are looking forward to taste the cello wines as well. I would really invite all of you to our vineyard and uh, winery in Nasik. And I hope to see you all soon. And thank you so much for inviting me onto this interview. And, you know, for such great questions and interactions. Yeah, it's really good to see you all. Yeah. Thank you, Shada. Because Sun, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it's great to re reconnect with you, especially yes. after graduation. And I have been following your work and reading the articles. <laughs> and yeah, you are doing such an amazing job. I'm sure you are going to be a rock star in the Indian wine industry. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, we are all looking forward mm, to yes. taste your thank wine you. in the future. Thank you so much. And I've been really inspired by the work you've been doing. And I always read your posts and everything. So it's really awesome to you know reconnect and discuss with you and talk. Yeah, it's really fortunate because it's been so long 
and yeah it's really great to see, see you again yeah mm -hmm. and i hope to see you soon yeah yeah i hope to see you soon as well yeah let's keep in touch and hopefully yes. you can come to tuscany as well yes for sure mm -hmm.